Um, thanks a lot for that introduction. Um, I hope you can uh, hear me late in the afternoon. Um, so uh, science for diplomacy is a very common topic. You all are experts on uh, some of the ideas there, I'm sure. So I don't want to dwell on very general things, but maybe tell you what I know from my personal experience. Um, so let's start uh, with the fact that the world now is much better connected than ever before, which you all know. And uh, this thing here, which is the global airline transportation network, shows you how well connected we are. And of course, different parts are connected to different densities, but by and large, it is clear that we are all very strongly connected. And we are also connected not just in fun, as the, uh, the traffic across the continents might tell you, but in misery as well. Uh, for example, if you remember the 2004 Indian Ocean tsunami near the uh, Indonesian coast, you might think, well, it won't affect people far away uh, in, uh, let's say, northern Europe. But you probably remember 552 Germans and 543 Swedes died there. So it just shows that people are all over the place. And that one time in 14th century when Europe was plagued with plague, it took uh, you know, one year to travel only 200 miles. But today, of course, if you have a um, communicable disease, in two weeks it's pretty much everywhere. So in fact, what this is saying is that both in fun and misery, we are all connected in time and space. And we live in a very strongly connected world. And all things affect all of us. I think those of us who think that, well, it's happening somewhere in Indonesia or in or some other place, and it's not going to affect us, I think are living in a dream world today. Um, now, yet we are divided by race, um, wealth, politics, language, etc. You probably know that the top uh, 300 wealthy people have at least as much wealth as the bottom 3 billion people. And so there are all kinds of disparities in the world. And politics, for instance, always um, seems to separate us. Even uh, sublime ideas like religion and patriotism, for instance, which seem to be great ideals and great things for which we all uh, subscribe at some point or another. And they can be unifying features within a country or within a region. But then when you expose it to outside um, uh, elements, they become divisive. So the hope has always been that natural science, uh, we, whose quest is to stretch the understanding of uh, what we know about nature, can be a uniting force. And it's partly because uh, we subscribe to a common methodology in science, uh, which is to say you appeal to external evidence, not to your internal beliefs. As soon as you say it's internal beliefs, you begin to have conflicts, or you could have conflicts. But when it is external evidence that you seek, well, in principle, at any rate, you can imagine that uh, you can have a certain unifying feature. This is the source of this concept, science for diplomacy. Um, that is to say, a positive effect of scientific knowledge and applications can enhance the well-being of all of us, and therefore it's a useful part of diplomacy. Now, there are, of course, exceptions. Um, Dual-use technologies, you know, military technology that can be used for both military purposes and for other uh, humanitarian purposes have some source for conflict. Likewise, there are issues of human rights uh, for scientists. For example, people in the United States might believe that certain scientists, let's say in, uh, in Latin America, are being held in prison against their will because of their political beliefs. But the rulers there will not think that. So there are always conflicts there. But ne nevertheless, I think it's a general understanding that um, we can uh, probably um, go forward with the science in the diplomacy. Wealth is another inhibitor for, uh, for um, for communication of scientific knowledge, 
because companies, for instance, wouldn't want to divulge their proprietary uh, knowledge because of money. But even then, you know that many big corporations are multinational and they really know where the strengths are and are quite happy to go outside their borders. So, um, big, uh, so let's talk a few about a few examples. Big science has always kept international diplomacy in the background. For example, you would uh, clearly have heard of the European Organization for Nuclear Research, which is CERN, which is in Geneva. And uh, this was conceived immediately after, a little bit after the Second World War and came into being in 1952 or 3 or whatever. And the whole idea was to bring um, Europe, which was fragmented at the time, uh, come to terms uh, with collaborating with each other. And uh, right now, uh, that's a picture taken in CERN. You can see the number of people uh, there who work there. There are probably about 12,000 fellows coming from 600 labs in many different countries. And uh, they work uh, very uh, collaboratively with great understanding of each other's limitations. Uh, likewise, you probably have heard of ITER. Uh, ITER is the International Thermonuclear Experimental, Experimental Reactor or something like that. This is to produce fusion. One hopes that when if the fusion experiment works, we will have an abundant supply of energy, although uh, no one knows for sure whether it will work or not. Nevertheless, it's uh, there. And uh, this, this graph here, is telling you what part of the world is involved in ITER. I mean, that's a very significant part of the world. And um, they work, again, very collaboratively. I don't know how many of you know this thing called Sesame, which is the synchrotron radiation experiment that is being built in Amman, Jordan. And this is a collaboration among many countries. And the idea was to put in Middle East a synchrotron facility that is commonly usable following the model of CERN um, by everybody. There are people from Iran and, uh, and uh, Israel work together, for instance, there. Uh, it's, it's not finished yet, but it is, uh, it, is, it is getting there. And you probably uh, know, I mean, this, by the way, is, uh, is uh, the building uh, for Sesame. And uh, you probably, all know, of course, know the International Space Station in which everybody Several countries are involved in at any rate. So big science has always been um, uh, relating uh, relating itself to diplomacy, if only out of necessity, because big science cannot be done by any country very easily. You have to work with a number of countries, and ITER, for instance, the expensive proposition, probably like 20 billion uh, euros or dollars, whichever, uh, makes no difference to me at that level. Everything looks the same. Uh, so um, the point is that kind of money is not accessible to any country by itself. So it is spread over different, different countries. Uh, also, you certainly know about these things called uh, ICSU. I don't know how many of you know about ICSU, International Council of Scientific Unions. It was created in 1931, and just again for purposes of bringing in collaboration among different countries. Especially during Cold War, it uh, had a, an important role between bringing the, uh, in bringing the US and the Soviet scientists together. Also, you might have heard of the Pugwash conferences. Pugwash just a village somewhere in Canada. And there, initially, a few scientists, many of them Nobel laureates, came together and said, well, here is where we should discuss about the, about the, um, the thermonuclear weapons, that is, uh, nuclear uh, weapons. And uh, this uh, has continued, and every year people of a uh, certain type get together and discuss the, how to deal with, uh, with nuclear weapons. And you probably know of IPCC, which is the International um, Panel on uh, Climate Change, or something like that. It's the one where uh, all the knowledge we have about climate change has been gathered in some fashion, although it's controversial somewhat. But without that panel, without this international collaboration and cooperation, this consensus people have, except for the United States, which is not in the consensus mode, um, uh, there is, uh, you could not have brought this about. 
So, that is the kind of uh, uh, general, general things about uh, science and diplomacy. What I am absolutely certain about and know it from my own experience that if you work together with a number of scientists from different countries, you begin to have respect for the scientists of those countries and people with whom you interact. The real question is how does this understanding that you develop among scientists, how do you translate it to political world which is where actually diplomacy becomes very important. So, uh, it is not enough for scientists from this country to officiate the science and scientists in, in Iran or something like that, uh, but then uh, people here, scientists here have to have cloud on the government, this is the same way that the scientists in Iran, Iran have to have uh, cloud within the government and then they have to have enough influence to bring to bear a certain uh, collaborative atmosphere. For that, it is very important that the scientists better be, uh, better have some gravitas in their own field. That is, if they really are lousy scientists, nobody cares uh, damn about them. So, you have to make sure that they actually know something and do well and accomplish something. The other thing is that um, those who are successful, you have to provide support. It is often not enough just to, just to say, well, okay, you are a good scientist and then leave them to their own. Uh, things and uh, there, are many, there are many countries in the world where the number of scientists are so small even though the countries may be very large um, and uh, very little support and without uh, international support they will wither away. For example, in my former center um, people used to come from Chad, there were only two mathematicians in all of Chad, Chad is such a huge country but then um, what are you going to do, how are you going to sustain their interest? And, and uh, then, so you have to first make sure you have enough support for them to do well and once they do well to support them in order to build up clout in their own countries and then in turn have an influence on, on their uh, things. So the experiment that um, uh, was in my title was done in, uh, is, being, is going on in Trieste, Italy. Um, uh, it's, uh, they have um, various institutions which are supported primarily by the Italian government but under the umbrella of United Nations uh, which really does exactly the two things I talked about and I will tell you how it is done and it might be, might be of interest to you independent of this conference itself. So the first one is the International Center for Theoretical Physics which I used to direct for some years uh, before coming to New York uh, and it is a, an organization, well let us do it like this. It is an organization that is um, supported by the combination of three, UNESCO which is on this corner, the International Atomic Energy Agency and the Italian government. In fact, most of the bill is footed by the, uh, the Italian government but UN organizations provide a certain umbrella which makes it possible for scientists from all countries to feel welcome in the center. And the idea was of the center was simply that uh, perhaps I should tell you where the where um, uh, TSA is. Uh, this is Europe, and uh, here this is the border between Italy, which is here, and Slovenia, which is just across. And the the location of that um, of that uh, city is uh, very important because it just lies at the border between uh, the Western world and what used to be called behind the iron curtain at one time. And therefore, it was e easy for people to move back and forth across this so-called iron curtain and people came to TSA from all over the world. And then there was the interest of the founding director, Abdul Salam, uh, whom I succeeded. Um, he had the Nobel Prize in 1977 and his idea was scientifically active men I put in and women, Salam would never say about women, um, <laughs> uh, must be kept in their own countries to build for the future. It is not enough just to bring them out to United States or somewhere, all good people you do not want to bring them here and then let the country man, uh, mind, the, uh, mind its own future, but you want to keep them in their country, but you have also got to preserve their scientific integrity. And how do you do that? And there was this, uh, this center does a number of things. I will not uh, tell you all about them. But basically what it does is uh, it will, it has a wide network of people 
who can tell you who are the good scientists in any given country. And then we bring them to our center, or what used to be my center, for a few months at a time, but never longer than a few months at a time. So during these months, there will be many programs they can attend, many visitors, some from developing countries, some from industrialized countries. They would all work together, collaborate together, and then they would go back and spend their time doing whatever they do in addition to doing science. And they would always rejuvenate their scientific interests, get to the forefront of, the, of their field by being at the center for a certain period of time. So that's the general principle. And, uh, and uh, oh, you probably don't want to know, we had only 35 scientists, but uh, it's a pyramid. Um, ultimately, we would have about 6,000 scientists per year. And of course, uh, programs would all be on the web, and there would be um, uh, hundreds of uh, um, web visitors, um, hundreds of thousands each year. So I will not take you through this slide, but basically what it is is that a small number of scientists who work in collaboration with a larger group of scientists from other countries, and they in turn work with a larger number of students and things like that, and it was very well set up in this fashion, and uh, we had the money to bring them to the center and, uh, and keep them there and provide them all the facilities and uh, things of that sort. So um, uh, maybe I will skip this one. Uh, you don't want to know about all the signs, perhaps. Um, but the main point is a very distinguished people all came to the center. And uh, I was very happy to know uh, many of them. But here is a kind of visitor statistics. For example, if you take uh, just uh, Europe and United States, you can see a large number from the US and Canada and a number from Europe and uh, also from Latin America and then uh, Africa and Asia and uh, uh, some part of Asia and some other part and things like that. So if in fact you take the percentage of developing country scientists, it would be approximately about 50%, but the scientists from developing countries wouldn't stay as long as the scientists from uh, uh, scientists from developed countries or industrialized countries would stay there as long as the scientists from other countries might. For example, somebody who came from, uh, let's say, Congo would stay maybe five weeks, whereas a scientist who is coming from Germany would stay there maybe four days, and then he would go back and come. So if you look at person ones, 70% would be from the developing countries. So basically, we had a very good mix of people. So there was a lot of interaction among people each learning from the other, not only about their science, but also about their countries and, and uh, that sort of thing. So this was how we built up the scientific capacity and the scientific abilities of people who are working in different countries. Many programs in uh, many developing countries owe themselves to the center. For example, after the Cultural Revolution in China, when science was basically uh, non-existent, um, this center was the one that enabled it to build up the, uh, the uh, program, let's say, conventional physics, which is now very strong in China, was entirely to uh, my center. Likewise, there are other programs in other countries that I can mention to you, one after the other. So it was very influential, uh, uh, that. Now, that done, now how do you build up their credibility within their own countries? in order for them to have certain clout and international support. And that was done through uh, these things called FWAS and IAP and IAMP, about which I'll say a few sentences, and then I might be done with it. So TWAS is, um, used to be called the Third World Academy of Sciences. This is the academy of all very good scientists with whom we built up uh, to be chosen as fellows of the academy. and. Um, now it's changed uh, somewhat uh, pretentiously to the, the World Academy of Sciences because a number of uh, fellows are from industrialized countries as well. The idea is to have them as members or fellows of this academy. And uh, this would be not only good scientists from developing countries, but also other scientists from, let's say, for example, from the US who have interest in developing countries and have made contributions to science there. 
And uh, right now it has about that many fellows, and uh, they come from 90 countries, and 85% are from developed countries. Dev Developing countries, uh, sorry about that. So um, that's the way the academy is structured. So what it does is, the, through the academy and the network that the academy has, uh, you sort of give them some credibility, much more credibility than you would otherwise, uh, otherwise have. And furthermore, the so-called IAP, which is the inter-academy panel, and this is the inter-academy medical panel, this is for the medical field and this is for everything else, provide independent advice on science-related issues to government and society. So this is the um, super academy, so to speak. All the academies in the world are networked to this IAP. So if you belong to one academy, you will have connection to all members of the academies in the rest of the world. I think that's extraordinarily helpful. And that way, uh, if you want something done, you can you know through the network who are the people to whom you can go, what are the organizations that are possible in order to make any inroads into the issues in which you're interested. So that's basically my personal experience. I was, as I said, the director of the uh, International Center for Theoretical Physics. I also was on the Council of FOSS and I connected to IAP and all that. At that time, I worked very hard for exactly this, using science as a, as a tool of diplomacy. I visited many countries met many prime ministers and presidents and ambassadors and so on. And it was possible through their help and support to build up many things in their own countries. It was just not for us, but, but uh, basically I can give you examples of things, but uh, that's probably not as important. Um, so what is the general lesson I learned? Uh, if you want to have the scientific capacity built and to sustain it, uh, you have to have a sustained engagement with an individual. It's not enough to say, well, I'll give you a fellowship for a year, and then you go off on your own, and nothing works, because once you uh, return to an environment where things are really not that active, you know, it's, if you are in uh, Harvard, let us say, it's not that hard to be active, because everybody around you is active, but if you go, I don't know, I don't want to name places, but if you go to a place where there's very little activity around you, it's not that easy. I mean, even though you may be bright, you may be motivated, the circumstances are very bad, and that is very hard for you to sustain yourself. Therefore, it's important to sustain a group, um, sometimes not just one individual, because around him or her, you have to build a certain environment, and that is one of the important things. And uh, next thing I learned was you have to have provide some sustained financial support. Um, you can't say, well, you know, they will let them apply to this or that uh, for a grant. And that's okay. It's okay to do that, but you have to also support them up to a point. And that has to be steady. And you can't say, well, I don't know, maybe next year we may not have the money or we may have the money. You have to have certain, uh, certain assurance, and you have to have an international umbrella. Uh, an international umbrella is important because then many of the problems that, have, that different countries have will disappear. For example, Algeria and, um, and uh, let's say Morocco have many issues with them, uh, between them, but the scientists, they will always come to our center, we we'll work together. We even thought about creating a new center between Algeria and Morocco. We just didn't know where to put it, so it was not very really easy. So there are always issues uh, like that that can be resolved if you have an international umbrella. And finally, uh, we need the committed uh, staff and people uh, with commitment to purpose. And uh, another important thing is uh, it's, uh, you have to put diversity and quality on equal footing. You cannot say, well, I will only support quality and that you can do, of course, if you're in Princeton, you can easily do that. And you can't, on the other hand, say, I will only care about diversity, I don't care about quality, I'll just take in whoever uh, from uh, disadvantaged um, background and countries. Because you can't build anything by doing that. So it's absolutely important to have both of them together. And that's one of the important lessons I learned. And of course, you have to have flexibility in how you operate while you are still accountable. So basically that's my general lesson. I don't, I don't want to take you through all this. 
basically it says about how things have changed in the scientific world uh, between the time I went there and, and now. Um, at that time, for instance, I took a look at the whole world and uh, uh, countries or regions that really had big problems were, uh, let's say, a uh, good part of the Middle East had issues. There was not much happening there. And then part of the Soviet Empire, that the, the, the Central South, South Asia, Central Asia, that was that had many issues. And then, um, then of course, a, a large part of the Sub-Saharan Africa had issues. So these were the three major areas on which uh, I myself worked at different points in my, my time there. And uh, now things have changed, not, not necessarily because of my effort, but the point is things have changed. Uh, things have changed in the Middle East. There are now new universities that are found, including NYU's own uh, thing in Abu Dhabi. Um, uh, there are in Qatar and other places uh, many interesting experiments going on. And uh, again, uh, in uh, Africa, uh, things have been changing, but it's difficult to keep uh, track of how things work there for a number of reasons. Um, and so things have changed. Uh, China has, of course, become an important force in science. It wasn't like that even 10, 15 years ago. Um, and Brazil, India, things, you know, things have changed. And some regions of the world have regressed entirely. For instance, in Afghanistan, uh, there is now hardly anybody who knows any science. There is hardly anyone who knows even English. Uh, this is a pity in a way. Um, for example, the UN uh, office there was trying to ask me whether we can do something for Afghanistan. But we reached out to the ambassadors and found that they said, just stay out of it because it's impossible. You don't know where to begin. You just don't know where to begin. Well, Libya was like that after uh, immediately after certain problems. And uh, we had uh, issues like that in Iraq, obviously. Uh, so there are parts of the world that have regressed, totally regressed. And uh, I think it will take generations for them to come up uh, to speed. But a good part of the world has, however, made progress. And this is how the world is. Some parts go well, and some parts just uh, uh, wither away, and uh, maybe it will take some time for them to come up. So in any case, I think um, uh, there is a lot that one can do with science in terms of uh, diplomacy. And in order to do that, basically, uh, you have to have uh, people with good understanding of what science is about and international cooperation is. And they have to have skills and clout within their own governments and, the, and have connections to the rest of the world. And that's what we should promote and we should try. And then maybe we'll hope for a better world one way or the other. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. We'd be pleased to invite questions or comments. As always, if you can raise your hand and then briefly introduce yourself so the professor knows who you are, please. And maybe stand, stand up as well, just so it's a little easier to hear. Thanks. Hi, I'm Andrea Caballero, and I'm from Colombia. I just want to know how's like that science development in Latin America. Like, I don't know in my country, like, we have like scientists, famous scientists, but like, how is that development? Yeah. Um, your country is actually not bad. In fact, they're very bright uh, Colombian students. Um, I think they get good education. But, uh, you know, there are not that many of them, and that's, uh, that's part of the problem. Uh, but still, a uh, lot of students came from Colombia to my uh, center. And uh, what is more, uh, what I did was, uh, Brazil was doing uh, much better. Brazil, of course, speaks Portuguese, and uh, Colombia doesn't speak Portuguese. Nevertheless, they are in the same continent. And so Brazil took some interest in trying to uh, trying to uh, support uh, Colombian students, and we help them getting some money and uh, you know that's the international connections. So by and large, I think um, my own impression is um, uh, Colombia has a huge potential, but it is not really exploited very well. So they're good students. I couldn't say that from every country, but uh, I think Colombia is. Yeah, I mean so. The best way to do this is, um, um, it can't be done always at the student's level, but um, if you take mid-level scientists and you sort of build a group around them in Colombia, and they in turn can support a number of students, that's the best way to help. 
Whereas we used to get some selected number of students, and we always help them. I always thought that was not enough. Additional questions or comments? Now's your chance. It was so rushed before. We didn't have such a chance earlier today, but also, yes, please. Yeah, thank you. Now, just a uh, thank you. I'm uh, Lisa. I come from Italy, actually. Okay. Um, I know you two are, and uh, I appreciate the work that the Italian government does. So if you go back to Milano or someplace, tell them that I said highly, talk highly about it. Okay. okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no, the, the thing that, I mean, I'm amazed, and I really thank you because it's, it was really, really nice. The thing that really always strikes me with science is that Italy has uh, great examples of this uh, kind of institutes or, I mean, a very famous uh, scientist. But at the same time, we, we score at the last place in the OECD countries for the scientific knowledge. I mean, our students, our schools, we are always, the, the, we have the black, uh, the, the, the weakest position. And this is something which, which always uh, surprised me. And I, I'm just curious to, to know what you, from your uh, hard science and big science perspective, what you think how is it possible? I mean, Italian scientists do very well internationally. Uh, for example, the present director of CERN is an Italian. Two times ago, the director of CERN is an, was an Italian. Yeah. Um, uh, okay, so, that, so and in fact, uh, there are, I have had a number of Italian students, and they are extremely bright. They just don't apply themselves very hard. They don't work very hard. <laughs> They're interested in uh, friends and uh, partying and things like that. So by and large, Italian students are very bright. This is my personal experience. Um, and I think um, I don't know about the school system. I mean, school, I have never really spent any time on the schools. But by the time the future through the system and then get to a PhD level, usually they are very good. Um, that's my impression. Uh, but I know that Italian universities are terrible. Italian universities don't have enough money. 95% of their budget goes into paying salaries. So there's only a small percentage of money that is available for doing anything new. I, it's, it's a pain in the neck. Um, I knew some universities very well. Um, but uh, the Berlusconi government was trying to change things. Unfortunately, it was a wrong government to change things. Nevertheless, um, uh, there were changes. I don't know how they have all you know, left Italy about seven years ago now. So I can't keep track of all the things. But it, Italian, uh, the problem is Italy spends a lot of money on the international things because Italy loves to be a player in international things. But it doesn't mind as much about its own things in the country, and that's a flaw in the, in the psyche of the Italian government. It doesn't matter which party, it doesn't matter what it is. They want to be in the international game, but to heck with what happens to the school system there. I think that's part of the problem. In Trieste, we, um, we went for um, uh, one of the international expos, and I made a presentation to all the delegates um, uh, in English, but I spoke a little bit Italian at the time, just saying how important the Italian contribution is. And uh, we made it to the second round, but obviously I was not convincing enough to get them to the final round. So, <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, once again, let's express our sincere gratitude.